A good Tuesday, July 11th to everybody. 1 p.m. on the East Coast. That means it's 10 a.m., Carter, on the West Coast. This is Market Call. Today's Market Call brought to you by CME Group, where risk meets opportunity. Of course, our data provider, Carter, is FactSet, financial data and analytics powered by tomorrow. Uh, you may note the absence of Dan Nathan. He's in Europe right now on a much deserved vacation. Good for Dan. I hope he's enjoying himself. I think that he is. Carter is back from Europe in his seat. It's a lovely, I think, I want to say that's sort of a salmon or maybe a pink shirt. Regardless, you look good in it. How are you, Dubs? I'm good. I'm just thinking about it. Yes, it's a brunch. Mark Hall is a brunch thing on the West Coast. And where Dan is, it's a dinner thing or a cocktail thing. But uh, here we are, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And uh, as always, lots of moving parts in the market. And uh, keeps us all on our toes. Yeah, there are lots of moving parts. You know, obviously we got through uh, month end, quarter end. Uh, I thought you might start to see some weakness around the edges. And you sort of got some of that last week. Obviously, today and yesterday maybe bucking the trend a little bit. There's some rebalances going on. There's a lot for everybody here. But first thing I want to take a look at, you know, the audience calls him Carl Keaton. I just call him Q. Some people call him CQ, but he put up a tweet earlier today. This is from a JP Morgan. Marco Kalanovic, who comes on Fast Money often, markets now broadly price a low probability of recession, while our base case remains that a U.S. recession is likely to begin near year end. We therefore trim two percentage points away from corporate bonds and government bonds. Well, all right, so that's a bond thing. But, I mean, basically, I read from this is, at current levels, um, the equity market, maybe the the bond market to an extent, pricing in a low probability of recession, which is fine. I mean, that again suggests this soft landing narrative that the uh, the Dow and the S and P at 4,400 seem to reinforce. I'm not there yet. And again, you know, you wore this hat many many years ago, and you can think at these levels. What is your sense about where we are right now? Before we start looking at some charts. I mean, there's so many ways to, you know, I mean, what's so interesting is, there, as always, there are always conflicting data points. Um, one thing to consider, like the recession, is it or isn't it going to happen? We have things like the dollar, which are arguing for, for weakness. Generally, we have, frankly, interest rates that are below where they were 10 months ago, which argues for peak in rates. And yet, if you look at something like machinery stocks in the S&P, they're making all-time highs, yeah. at least cyclical things. Um, and so uh, there's always a mixed message. Uh, what I would point out is this, that we are the exact same level right now in the S&P as we were two years ago. So on a two-year basis, unch, but the risk reward has been terrible. Max gain from two years ago to today is 10%. Max mm -hmm. drawdown was 20. So if you have an endeavor of any kind, which leaves you with no results unchanged, but one had a max upside of 10% and a max downside of 20, uh, that is called on a risk adjusted basis, a bad proposition, right? So can that change? Can things ultimately get better? But we know that the sell-off that was 2022, 37% in the NASDAQ 100, 27% in the S&P was not anticipated by anyone. Wall Street had bullish price targets for 2022 as did individual analysts. So now maybe, uh, yes, they're not as bullish, but the truth is the equity market has not returned to those who've been long risk adjusted results that warrant the exposure to it for the risk assumed. It's interesting through that lens, it makes a lot of sense. Obviously, you know, the other lens is the shorter term lens, the fact that you know, the market sold off as precipitously as it did last year. And then you obviously had this Silicon Valley Bank event in March. And I think a lot of people, probably myself included, if I were to go back and listen, thought, OK, that's going to be the trigger for the next one. So your point is extraordinarily well taken. But when you look at it a little shorter term, it leaves you somewhat perplexed as to, you know, how we're here. But through that lens, it makes a lot of sense. Let's just look at the chart that we drew. And we're not suggesting these lines are correct. What we did was we did that horizontal line from last summer where we topped out. I want to say 43.35 or so. You know, here we are 
4,400 and change ish, um, seemingly held that previous resistance level or resistance level. What's your thoughts here? Are we looking at this correctly? Um, because now we find ourselves, you know, standard deviation or two away from that 150 day moving average, which by the way, I think you would submit because you can see it, you know, this sloping higher is not a bad thing. Right. So again, it's always and ever thus, uh, it's where one starts one's narrative, where the storyline begins or where one committed capital to the point we were discussing earlier. Basically, equity market as measured by the S&P is unchanged from what it was on August 22nd, we're July. Uh, so a year later, again, the risk reward of having been exposed to equities is really, really poor, unchanged, a, a, a percent maybe from August, but a drawdown of 10 plus percent. And, and, and the question is, you know, people say, yeah, but I bought the low or other people said I bought it. I chased it in August mm -hmm. and I'm just back to break even. Everyone's got their own experience and they all net out to be what is the market. The question is, are we really in a position to go meaningfully higher from here when much of the heavy lifting has been done by names that are actually starting to struggle now? Things like Apple and Microsoft. My hunch is we're just uh, going to do a normal check back or continue the sequence, which you see is get back towards that 150 million average. Yep. Listen, I, you know, I'm with you on that. It, it's just, I guess the frustration for me is things not, not that it's not happening faster, but it's just not presenting itself in a way that I think we all can see. Let's take a look at the VIX because maybe there's something here. You now, obviously we got down to sort of a 12 handle or so, which seemed pretty extreme. We've seen a bounce in the VIX, but, you know, at current levels, it's not like it's meaning all that meaningful either side of sort of 15. And I'm not asking you to chart the VIX. I'm not asking us to trade the VIX. But is it telling you anything whatsoever? Not particularly. Other than that little pop and jump back towards 1750 left you uh, at a level of overhead supply, if you will. You can't use that phrase with the VIX. But if it were a uh, stock where shares are changing hands. And so not much messaging in this other than to say it's low, just as the AAII bull uh, mm -hmm. reading is high, right? We, we've got a very uh, one-way tape and a one-way uh, sentiment situation. Let's take a look at uh, our next slide because I think this is interesting. It's talking about the Fed, and they continue the hawkish comments out of Fed officials. And Lawrence Summers, I want to be clear here, is not, but he obviously sat – in a chair for quite some time that had some gravitas to it. But once again, this is, this is Larry Summers. This is not me. Once again, the Federal Reserve has underestimated inflation for basically the eighth quarter in a row. I agree. They've been surprised on what's happened to inflation because they're surprised at what's happening with inflation and the strength of the economy. They're going to be surprised by what they have to do to interest rates. So I look at this and say, I agree with them, number one. Uh, I do think they're probably, they being the Federal Reserve, is surprised. But I think what the market is not taking into consideration is what Larry Summers is basically saying. They're going to have to move and they're going to have to be higher for longer. And I don't think, and again, I know you can speak to this, you know, I don't think at a 4,400 S&P, we're properly, properly taking into consideration what Larry Summers is saying here. Sure. So it's, it's uh, again... Uh, rates go meaningfully higher. Does that does affect the or change the assumptions or the, the multiples assigned to long duration assets and so forth and so on? In principle, while that's what they say in the textbooks and that's many way, the way people behave, it shouldn't matter, just to be clear, if 10 year yields are three or four percent or four and a quarter or 375, when one is trying to do three to five year. Uh, cash flow analysis and assign a value. But Wall Street is very myopic and a, a little bit of a bump up in rates. Again, we're not talking about 7%, 8%. Then, yeah, you have to you have to change your your, your assumptions. But 375, four and a quarter, 350, 390, it's all the same thing. It's a low cost of long-term capital and it shouldn't affect multiples or the assumption multiples the way the street moves them around. Either way, obviously rates go higher and meaningfully so you assume that you have multiple contraction. One would think, but we're clearly not seeing that. And, you know, as a matter of fact, for a lot of individual names, specifically the names we talk about seemingly all the time, the moves have just enlarged. And I don't want to say entirely because that's not fair, but I would say for some of them, 
anywhere from 65 to 75 percent of these moves has been exactly that multiple expansion there's no other way to explain it in my opinion we have a question from matrix of compassion who's with us every day so moc thanks for joining i don't know if i can answer this i think you may be better suited but I can't either. how will the july ndx rebalance impact the ndx and the spx this is what i'll say i think these rebalances are typically gamified way ahead of time so i think historically Maybe there have been some trades off the back of them. This is, again, just my opinion. I think the market's become sophisticated enough where they sort of game ahead or trade ahead of some of these things. So my sense is that it's going to be somewhat muted. I'm not suggesting I'm right, but that's just my instincts, Carter. No, what the sell side saying? has teams trying to, just as you have teams trying to figure out who's going to next M&A candidate, they have teams of quants trying to figure out who will be removed from an index, who will be added. This stock is certain daily average volume it's moved up this much over the past six months it's beating its peer group by this much it's likely an addition and so a lot of it is and while not necessarily accurate um a lot of it is gamed and attempted to be figured out before let's take a look at the next question it's from gary maggio i hope i pronounced that right carter nice call on comcast let's pull up a comcast chart real quick if we can on the fly uh, and then we're going to look at DraftKings in a second. But nice call on Comcast. Let's take a look at it if we can. CMCSA, I believe, if memory serves. Uh, and, you know, this is a chart you highlighted, a few, I want to say, a few weeks ago. And it was one of the great Carter charts where the end of it had that sort of up arrow suggesting, you know, we were ready for one of these moves. And that's come to fruition. It feels as if, and this is just me talking, we're probably running against some resistance here. Um at current levels, not to suggest it can't keep going, but you know, this is probably um, the first leg might be ready for sort of a pause here. What are your thoughts? Yeah, first of all, Gary, obviously we don't know one another, but thanks for calling out a nice one. I've got endless duds stacked up and that's the nature of this business. But um, I think it works higher. If we pull this back and look at the little bit longer term chart, it has all the elements of a bearish to bullish reversal, a really a protracted a decline, a, a wipeout, and then now making the turn. I think earnings are coming in the next day or days, and I'm anticipating a pop. DraftKings is another name. So again, stocks have just gotten obliterated, but you know, DraftKings have been getting off the mat. And this again, it has one of those. You talk about it all the time: bearish to bullish reversals. Um, moving averages are starting to work for you in terms of now sloping higher for the first time in a while. We're probably at levels where this thing can continue to levitate. And I'm just sort of reading tea leaves before you get to sort of the 50% retracement of the levels we saw in the spring of 21 uh, against the lows we saw recently, get that 50% retracement. And there's still some room to run. And I'm just doing this on the fly, Carter. So I know it's not fair to you, but let's take a quick gander no, as to what you think. What's so important is the how, how formations repeat. Look at the top. It's a perfect head and shoulders from which it collapsed. Look at the bottom. It's a perfect double bottom. Mm -hmm. um, and now a well-defined bearish to bullish reversal that has come a long way. So uh, this is where I would sort of split the difference. One has to acknowledge it has come a long way. And yet, is the momentum intact? If we give it up here and it keeps going, uh, well, that's a shame too. I would reduce or trim or retain the longs and sell calls. So we get the CME FedWatch tool quickly, and we're going to take a look at some rates charts that you brought along. But I think it – well, I shouldn't – again, I just think it seems to be a foregone conclusion that we're going to move again. I think the Fed has basically told you as much. I think if you read the tea leaves and see what's been going on in yields, they're suggesting exactly that. Um, again, I'm surprised at how well the equity markets has taken this, but we just wanted to look at this. This just shows sort of – the certainty around um, what a lot of people have already talked about. So let's take a look at the charts you brought now and it's 10 year yields, which I, you know, I will tell you um, I thought if correctly for a period of time, that 10 year yields were going to fall. And my premise was, or my logic was that the economy here was slowing, which is sort of playing out. And if the equity market sold off, um, you'd see a flight to quality in the form of 10 year yields, meaning yields would go lower. That played out for like a day. And now here we are, I mean, just sort of ratcheting higher through this pennant. But now I'm going to stop talking and let you sort of walk through the charts that you brought. Sure. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to toggle back and forth here. This one and the next one, we'll do it repeatedly. Let's go to the first. So, yes, 
we've broken out and we've moved above the downtrend line, but we're nowhere near. And we're also notice rates are dipping here, even ever slightly. We're nowhere near those highs. Those highs are September, October. We're almost lapping the year ago high in rates. And so rates have generally, I think, been topping, right? Or have peaked and that we aren't really going higher. And were we even to go higher, it's going to be an increment higher. So if you just can say, well, yes, we've moved above the downtrend line, the first iteration, but we're still way below the peak of September, October. And I don't think that uh, the, the, at one point consensus was this was going to be five and a quarter. And all it's done is go down ever since. Yeah. It's again, it's been fat. Now we've been talking about the, the yield curve twos versus 10. So of course you brought two year yields as well. And it's, it's a, not a similar story. This actually suggests that we got to those levels and are stalling. Now, if I could toggle back quick, you know, what you're saying is in the 10 year, there may st still be some room to run to get to the levels we saw maybe in the fall. Um, in terms of the two year, did that move already happen? Now, obviously, it's not the fall. It's early spring, late winter type of thing. But my, I think you understand my point. What are your thoughts here? Yeah, I mean, uh, again, I, I, my, my hunch is that it, it, all around the curve, right, and you can see this in the five-year, any point in the curve, that rates anticipated a lot of what we're seeing now long ago, of course, and that we are not in the, we're not setting up for meaningfully higher rates. We're setting up for either just staying here or ultimately rates go lower. And, and I think the two-year, the fact that it's struggling at that former high is telling. Which means the next chart, which is the inversion, the twos versus tens. Now, you're telling a story here. What you're saying, and I, again, I'm not going to speak for you, but you drew the little ovals or whatever, the little smiley faces, suggesting that this inversion might have a bit of a double bottom, which suggests, again, I'll let you do the talking, that you know this might ratchet back to instead of being 105 basis points inverted, maybe back to 50 basis points. Now we can debate what that means for the market, but let's just look at this specifically right now. Right. It's how you get there, whether it's more from the two or less from the 10, it's in, in, in the bull steepener, bear steepeners. But the truth is, and this is, there's no way around this. We got down to exactly the March low, about 111 basis points, and we stopped to the penny. And you'll see if you put a trend line here that basically the check back, when mm -hmm. we get back to the March lows has held above that trend line. So, where might we be headed? Uh, the third iteration, you'll see the trend line that comes into effect higher up uh, would suggest, and, and you'll see it here on the next chart, that uh, we can work our way back towards, you know, 60, 65, that kind of thing, mm -hmm. Brad, rather than where we are now. I agree. Now, the next question is, and, and this is something that EY from SoFi talks about, it's not the inversion, the steepness of the inversion that concerns her, although that is concerning in and of itself. It's when things start to go the other way where the market, the equity market potentially could get dicey. So just taking her thesis there and then looking at your chart, you sort of line those up and you wonder that, you know, if we get less inverted, the move back to about, you said, 47 basis. It's, you know, what, or excuse me, it's probably closer to about 60 basis points or so. But whatever it is, back to that downtrend line, what's going to happen to the underlying equity market? Now, I'm probably being dogmatic here and suggest that that, you know, uninversion or the move back the other way is probably not going to be particularly bullish. Other people will take the other side of it. And again, I'm not trying to put you on the spot here. And I don't know if there's any historical data necessarily, but and you said it, it's all about how we get there. So it's just quick thoughts on that. Yeah, I get it. And that's unknown. I think the important thing is when we were getting to a negative 111 base points again, um, there was a real move off that low. And so I, I have to assume, right, that we're going to follow through and uh, somewhere between what you said, 40 and let's say 65 uh, spread. Let's take a look at the dollar because, you know, Again, so much of what we talk about is influence impacted by the dollar. Typically, the dollar moves things, not vice versa. But I think your work suggests, and I think this is going to line up with sort of what I've been thinking about, precious metals and energy and some of the commodities, 
is this dollar move might be uh, the move. We, listen, the huge move we saw into the fall of last year is clearly over. Uh, the trend changed. Uh, the dollar has bounced along the way, but the trend to the downside continues. And these little mini bounces have been exactly that, mini bounces. Right. So we're, we're sticking with the, the short dollar um, view and recommendation to clients uh, since fall. This is this is where I think rates the message here. Where does the dollar peak? September, October. Mm -hmm. That's when rates peak. Rates have moved back up, but the dollar's not buying it. So if rates were really going higher, why are REITs doing so well? Why is the dollar doing so poorly? Mm -hmm. The messaging here is, I think, is that the, the rates are a little bit of a head fake of late. And the dollar has all the elements of a bullish to bearish reversal. So you can put in a trend line, you can use the moving average, or you can put them both in. But the point is, um, this does not jive with meaningfully higher rates, just as the strength in REITs and other rate-sensitive areas of the market does not jive with higher rates. So let's just talk about that for a second, because, you know, we can pull up, well, for example, I mean, we'll do this on the fly. We'll look at a crude oil chart in a second, but look at some of the names in the equity, in the energy space. For example, the OIH is something we talk about for a while. And I know you were on Fast Money last night with a bullish call, and it's something I think the two of us have been talking about, but that's a pretty powerful move in the OIH, sort of this stealth rally that nobody seems to be talking about. You know, in terms of levels, seemingly every time we get sort of this 245 level on the downside, it's proven to be support. We bounce. But this bounce, there seems to be something else going on here. Um, I happen to think it's based in fundamentals. We've talked about the fundamentals for a while. Maybe the technicals suggest something. And again, I look at this and say, OK, it appears as though we're going to take a run back to the levels we saw uh, last year, right? Or maybe it was earlier this year. My point is, you know, we're getting, I think we're setting up for a move back to that 325, 330 level. And it was earlier this year. Right. So the, the energy complex overall, right, is, is, well, how would I say? It? So is it a sector? We know that the 11 sectors uh, that um, compose the S&P, energy itself is 4.2%. And Exxon, Chevron, and Schlumberger are 50% of the sector. So is it a sector <laughs> at 4% of the S&P, or is it three, four, five, six mm -hmm. stocks? Either way, we know that the big heavy integrated Exxon and Chevron act very poorly, but you've got new 52-week highs and all that tidewater, diamond offshore, and then in turn things like Schlumberger, Halliburton, Baker Hughes coming to life. I think this is the best area within the energy complex, and I think it works higher. Agreed. Agreed. And so, as you know, we started talking about the dollar. Let's look at gold because that's something you brought as well. Now, Danny Moses and I did our radio show yesterday that uh, Dan is obviously on. Danny filled in for him yesterday, but we talked about gold and we talked about how the setup was really starting to get interesting. I do think it's interesting, but. It needs to do some work. These are our lines, not yours. I want to be clear. So we do sort of mediocre work at best when compared to you. But you look at this, you may say pair of twos. Uh, you know, we've been in this downtrend. I think we're about to break out of the downtrend and take another run. What are your thoughts on gold here, specifically off the potentially move lower in the dollar that you brought up before? Right. So it's a sell-off. And the question is a sell-off, which represents weakness. There's only two types of weakness to take advantage of and weakness to stay away from. Uh, I think it's the former and that it's a, a sell-off to a level of support at or near the 150 moving average. And my hunch is to buy. And uh, if you're long, to stay long. And of course, the dollar weakness doesn't hurt. Does not. Nor does it hurt crude oil as well. Now, these are back to your chart. So let's take a look because this is, again, some of the work you've done over the last few days. Um, you know, let, I'll let you do the talking here. But again, I look at this, the naked eye and say, okay, we did a lot of work on the downside. We tried, we tried, we tried, unable to break it. Now it might start to try the other way. Thoughts? Right. Well, it's, it's quite often right to stay with trend until, um, or stay with momentum until you get something hysterical. Uh, there has been extreme bearishness in crude, people talking $30, $40 a barrel recession. Guess what? Back in March mm -hmm. 2022, Wall Street projected $250 a barrel because of the Ukraine. 
literally calling the top. And now people start talking about 50, 60, go the other way. To me, to my eye, it has all the elements, and there you see it, of something that's turning, that's basing and bottoming. Hasn't made a new low since March. Day-to-day -day action is very constructive. I think you want to play, and that gas too. I think you want to uh, play on the long side for energy equities and the commodities as well. I agree with that. Um, it's been a tough one for a while now. You know, I know Dan's been bearish and correct. I've been bullish and wrong. Although I will tell you, you know, the flip side of that is, you know, the energy names have held in there. Yes, Exxon since earnings, I think it traded up to 121, hasn't traded particularly well. But the stocks seem like they're holding in there. You brought some charts, I think, and you want to speak to how you get there as well. So we're looking at a, a ratio chart, a relative strength line, one thing divided by another. This is the energy sector's relative performance to the S&P 500. And the 2020, 2022 rally or outperformance energy stopped to the penny. You could see it with the arrows drawn on the next iteration and hit its head. The question now, having underperformed for past eight months, is it time to dip one's toe into energy equities? Look at the next uh, iteration. This is an all data chart. And then we might have one more here. And now this is what's interesting. Let's toggle that prior one. So a big period of outperformance for two years, 2020 mm -hmm. to 22, hits its head right at a downtrend line that was in effect since the all-time high in relative performance in 08. And now the second. So why does this line matter? Basically, the worst that energy ever got relative to the market was, of course, COVID. Well, COVID was... There were no cars driving. There were no planes. There was nothing. Everyone's sitting in their house. So if you can excuse, if you will, the exception of a 100-year storm a pandemic, right now the brown line is back to its 1999-2000 dot-com relative low, which is to say energy is out of favor now as it was at the peak in 99-2000, with the exception, of course, COVID. And so my thinking... Put an arrow in here that we're going to bounce and that's uh that's a judgment but it's mine I and i agree with it and we have a bunch of more charts that i want you to walk through i'm just going to add my two cents and say you know think about think about what was in vogue in 99 2000 quickly go back to that last toggle back to that last chart what was in vogue back then were these high flying uh, high valuation tech names that were never going to go lower. Uh, where have you heard that over the last you know few months? So exactly history right. is clearly repeating itself. If you just, again, look at this chart uh, and take it for what it's worth. We don't make up the levels. I mean, the levels do them, you know, they That's do right. what they do themselves. We're just trying to speak to the levels and what they mean. So right. you don't think history repeats? Well, it's repeating itself right now. Carl. It is. Cisco, uh, to Guy's point, was the most viable company in the world. And the PE on the transports was like poor. I mean, it's just classic stuff. Anyway, um, as to energy sector itself, this next chart is the energy sector, but it's what the XLE looks like. So one could say, well, yeah, you put the line because you want it. Look, the line fits. Put some arrows in here. I mean, put, talk about to the penny. So I'm not making the line fit. The line is the line. Now, more importantly, look at the next line. We have converging trend lines. Mm -hmm. Do we move above this? Uh, we're doing it today. Um, I like it. Um, this is a this is oil services relative to all energy. We haven't made a low for three years. This is OIH effectively to XLE. If you look at the next iteration, it's a move above a downtrend. OIH long, XLE short in a perfect paired world. If we could toggle back two charts quickly, because um, I want to take a look at something. You know, we're at this. So I'm going to ask you a question. So the uptrend line, which goes back to December of 2020, by the length of the duration, that would suggest that the uptrend is stronger than the short term downtrend. Now, your arrow is obviously higher. Am I reading that the right way? It should. One, if listen, if both of the durations, you know, if you had this perfect triangle, that both lined up over the last three years, then I guess you sort of flip in a coin. But here yeah. you have an uptrend for the last three and a half years, give or take, a downtrend that basically started last fall-ish. Mm -hmm. The uptrend is stronger than the downtrend. And I think your work suggests that that downtrend, which has been in place eight or nine months-ish, maybe a little bit longer, is going to be taken out. So am I looking at that correctly? Yeah, there's... Um... 
look, the, 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 the strength and duration and magnitude of the advance dwarfs that of the give back, right? Now, and, and this is fair, the bear would say, look, it's rolling over. You can't see that. I mean, what's wrong with you? Um, and it's going to break your uptrend line. And the whole thing's uh, uh, going to tell us that there is a recession. And the last thing you want to do is be in energy stocks. Um, my hunch is otherwise, and that even if that's the case, that energy, and this is not a technical phrase, but energy is, quote, cheap, if you will, um, and that they don't have the downside risk associated with uh, a normal recession. Greg's asking for Guy and Carter, um, and I'm not looking to tee you up here at all. Where, where are the best pl- where best to play energy ETFs or individual stocks? I'm sorry I'm reading, by the way. Some with gas, saying some you like, and why, please. So I'll take a stab at this quickly. Um, if Carter is right about the underlying commodity, which I believe that he will be, I think you want to be in some of these levered names. And if, you know, we're, we're just going to do this on the fly quickly because we're running out of time. But I look at names, for example, a PSX, the old Phillips 66. I don't know if they still call it that or not. But if we could pull up a chart in, in this stock quickly, you'll see that, you know, it struggled along the same lines that other these, you know, some of the indices that Carter brought forth has struggled. But here we are. Um, is it enough? We got to the moving average. Are we going to break through? So this is a name that I look at that I think if Carter's right, we're going to make that next iteration higher. I also look at a name like APA. That's the old Apache. I think it's called APA Corp now. It's going to look pretty similar. Um, but you see, again, I look at this and say, you know what? Nice little potential double bottom here. We're pushing up to the 200-day, or the, excuse me, 150-day moving average. We'll see what happens. But these levered names make sense. And obviously, the OIH is something we talked about before. Carter, I don't know if you have any individual names you want to throw out on the fly, but that's sort of my two cents. Well, the strongest are things like Tidewater and Diamond Offshore, again, uh, that are literally making uh, 52-week highs. And so if you're wanting to respect that momentum and stick with it, that would be the best play. The most nuanced thing, and I don't know the answer but is this, that the Exxon, Chevron, um, the big heavies that have lagged so much. Can energy as a sector really move higher? And can Schlumberger continue and so forth and Diamond and Tor if the big ones don't come along? So the true contrarian would say, I'll bet you these big ones finally actually pop the way Schlumberger and Halliburton do. Um, that's a, a judgment I can't make. I, it's a perfectly valid thesis. But as to individual stocks versus ETFs, you always have idiosyncratic risk. With an individual stock, this is elemental, whereas owning an ETF like an OIH or XLE or XOP, um, right, uh, the exploration production, is is maybe the better way to capture the theme. My love for you knows no uh, boundaries, Carter Braxton Worth. So thanks. Great to have you back in the ATOS UNIS, as they say. I want to thank the audience. I want to thank the folks back in our Great studios at the current offices. That, of course, would be Jacob, Amanda, Stephen, Rafis, Millie, whoever else is there. Well done by you. Kylie left us. She's going back to Yale, I believe, or she's going to Europe. But she had a great run. But that's it for today. I want to thank our sponsor, CME Group, Carter, where risk meets opportunity. Of course, our data provider is FactSet Financial Data and Analytics, powered by tomorrow. Speaking of tomorrow... You'll be back with me for your usual Wednesday uh, performance, and we'll be back at 1 o'clock Eastern time. I thank you all. Bye.